The Turner Prize was set up in 1984 by the newly formed patrons of the new art, and its aim was twofold. Firstly, to attract lively and intelligent debate for new art, across the broad spectrum, and secondly also for the Tate to be involved in contemporary art without spending too much taxpayers' money because the gallery was still reeling from the scandal in the mid-70s which surround, surrounded the notorious affair of Equivalent 8, the Carl andre pile of bricks which the gallery had purchased. So, 1984, the first Turner Prize. Malcolm Morley wins, he's an expatriate, he also served a short prison sentence earlier in his life, so that attracted a big media scandal, lots of attention, and the Turner really seemed to be taking off with gusto. After then, during the 80s, it went a bit wobbly, its rules changed, it didn't really have a set format until the early 90s, 1991 to be precise, when Channel 4 took over the sponsorship and it assumed the format that it has now, pretty much, bar a few adjustments. 1991, I feel, was the year that the Turner Prize really came of age. There'd been some great prize winners before, Tony Cragg, Richard Deacon, Gilbert and George, but this was the year that the prize settled into the format that we now know. What was so funny was that of the four shortlist, Anish Kapoor was the winner, but he seemed like a grand old man, even though he was only 37 years old. It really seemed like a new spirit and art was now washing through the Turner Prize. By the mid-90s, British art was really burgeoning, and I think the so-called YBA generation were really leaping to the forefront, as is evidenced by this marvellous piece by Damien Hirst, who was the prize winner for 1995, Mother and Child Divided. But let's not forget, he'd been shortlisted beforehand, and quite often in the Turner's history, artists are shortlisted more than once. Willie Doherty, Rachel Whiteread, and now Mark Wallinger. So I think that's interesting too, that you know artists can have several bites at the Turner, but certainly at this point in the mid 90s I think Hearst winning seemed very much part of the zeitgeist and part of the spirit of the times. I think 1997 was also a crucial year in the history of the Turner Prize because for the first time there was an all-woman shortlist and it did show that by then and indeed by now you don't need to be a woman artist you're just an artist and they were four amazingly strong artists Cornelia Parker, Angela Bullock, Gillian Waring the winner and um, Christine Borland and I think it just laid down the marker that these issues didn't matter anymore although having said that only three women have actually won the Turner Prize in its entire history so there's still room for some improvement when you think of the amount of women artists out there making excellent work. The year 2000 is obviously a key year in every respect, the beginning of the new millennium and the opening of Tate Modern. And that year was the year that the Turner Prize very resolutely remained in Tate Britain because after all it's a prize devoted to art made in Britain. And I make that distinction because I think what's interesting about the year 2000's Turner shortlist and indeed winner is it showed the internationalism of what it meant to be making art in Britain. Wolfgang Tillmans, the winner, German born, Britain based. The fact that artists from all over the globe now come and make art in Britain I think is a test to the diversity of the scene and feeds into it. So I think that year's Turner Prize shortlist really reflected the true nature of what it meant to be making art in Britain. There have been so many great artists involved with the Turner Prize, great winners, great shortlisters, uh, but I would love to single out a few of my top favourites. I think Chris Ophelia certainly rates very high in my, in my hit list. This great painting, No Woman, No Cry, commemorating the death of Stephen Lawrence, just shows what painting can be made to say and do conceptually, formally, visually. And putting painting in the Turner Prize in a way that's fresh and exciting. Martin Creed's The Lights Going On and Off. I mean, what a bold piece. This shows what the Turner Prize can do to, to applaud the most radical art, the most difficult, if you like, but also the most immediate art. And it was not a popular choice, this necessarily, amongst many people, but I think it just shows how important the Turner is that an artist of Creed's stature and a work of this boldness won the Turner Prize and indeed was shown at the Tate at that time. I think standing in this room, which has the most recent years of the Turner Prize, just shows how important the Turner Prize still is to show the breadth, the diversity, the scope of, of what's being made in Britain at the moment. You've got Jeremy Della, who tracks youth movements, who films bats coming out of caves, who makes acid house um, music be played by brass bands. He works with communities. He isn't there on the artist's pedestal. He's working out there in different aspects of, of the world we live in. You've got Grayson Perry, who won in 2003, who makes these exquisite pots, these ceramics, but highly 
subversive at the same time as being exquisite to show that even the lowly art of pottery and coil pots at that, not even thrown ones, can be elevated to the highest echelon of fine art. And then you've got Toma Apps to one last year who makes these quiet, beautiful, abstract paintings which reference so many painters of the past but which speak in such a quiet but insistent voice of their own. So this shows to me that the Turner Prize still is so relevant just to reveal to the world at large, the British public and everybody else just how, how multifarious British art can be, how contemporary art now wears so many different guises and can be open to so many different interpretations.